My name is Jeremy Ballantyne, and I am the host of the most shocking interview yet. I apologize in advance in this episode, as unfortunately there was an issue with the Zoom recording, and my side of the uh, video was not captured. So in the place, I will just have a picture of myself so that you know who's talking, uh, but... Uh, like the Joe Schmo show, I'll just blame it all on Ingrid. So it's, uh, no, she was wonderful. Enjoy this interview. Welcome to the most shocking interview yet. Today, we continue our deep dive into the early 2000s classic reality, not so reality TV phenomenon, the Joe Schmo show. Today, we are blessed to have the woman that was every first in Joe Schmo history. She was the first female Schmo the first schmo to figure it out, the first schmo to join the cast, and the first schmo to share the secret names of her breasts. Look at your boobs, oh, man. I'm sorry. Right. Here I am, me, Bertha, and Louise. <laughs> oh, you named them. Ingrid Weiss, thank you, Ingrid, for joining us. It has been nearly 20 years since Joe Schmo aired. What have you been up to since the show? Oh, geez, 20 years. It has been a long time. Um, let's see, since the show, I've been... Uh, uh, building a company, building a family, traveling, uh, lots of fun things, lots of fun things. But of course, I still have a fond place in my memory for Joe Schmo. Walk us through the casting process. This is our first time talking to a Schmo, so we know the casting from the, the actor side. What's it like from, we'll call it a Schmo side, but a contestant side? You're really, you're really pushing my memory here, Jeremy. <laughs> 20 plus years here. Let's see. So from casting, um, well, essentially they were they were running some interviews uh, or I guess sidewalk had they had a camera and they were running some sidewalk interviews one night when I was out with my friends and they said, hey, uh, come on over here. We'd love to have you make. I wasn't going to do it, but my it was with a friend who was really scared of any kind of public experience. And so I said, let's do it together. And we went over and did a couple funny things. They asked you for a talent. They had you spin around. And really, it was just a chance to have a story to tell later, which is how I kind of think of the whole Joe Schmo experience. <laughs> so, um, so, so that was the start. And then a few weeks later, I got this phone call uh, that they were interested in bringing me out to California. I thought it was a joke. I think I might have even hung up. I was like, ha ha, very funny. Um, and then I think I did hang up and they called me back and I said, uh, they, once I, they convinced me that it was for real, I said, okay, let me think about this. Do I want to go out to California for this casting process? And at the time I was on the list for the state department. So I had, a, I had to wait for my number to get called up and I was cocktail waitressing and making zero money. Um, while I waited for my spot on the list. So I was, uh, they had promised some uh, financial, they said, if you get cast on the show, you're going to get $20,000. I was like, Shh, done. That'll get me through like four months. <laughs> so I flew to Los Angeles. They met me at the, at a hotel near LAX. <laughs> I now live in LA. So it's really funny. Um, I mean, I didn't see anything except for the, the street between the, <laughs> between LAX and the hotel. I don't know anything about LA. I don't know anything about reality TV. I don't know anything about, and they had us in this hotel rooms and we weren't supposed to go out of the room or, um, and we had to wait till someone came to knock on the door and it was just all the secrecy and weirdness to it. And they came up I, at one point, I almost went home cause they came up and they said, we need to take a Polaroid of you wearing a bathing suit <laughs> to bring down. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I felt very uncomfortable with that, but I'm already in LA and I'm like, this is the kind of stuff you hear about on those, <laughs> on those after school specials, but okay. So I uh, posed coyly at the end of my bed for some woman production assistant and um, and then they, uh, I guess I passed the Polaroid test. So they invited me downstairs for a series of interviews, uh, 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 experiences, experiential interviews. At that point, I had gone through a couple of these types of interviews uh, for government agencies. So I was prepared for a group dynamic and question and answer and some interviews. So it was funny, the crossover, of course, they were looking for very different things uh, when you're interviewing for the State Department than when you are interviewing for a reality TV show. But um, one of the things they had me get together with a group of other women 
and they had us do, gosh, I can't remember what they had us do. They had us play a game and um, we played this game and I, I believe Amanda was there. I don't even remember, but I think she was there. I don't remember her being in the room. There were only about eight of us at that point. They took me in for like a, a one-on-one -on -one interview that they filmed. And I could hear people laughing from the room next door whenever I would talk. So <laughs> that was one good sign. But yeah, it was just a weird. And then at one point they had me in a room and they had someone come in and just be kind of silly. Like it was a guy that came in and they wanted to know what I thought of him. And I think they were just watching for my facial expressions. Can you tell what this person's thinking? I mean, who knows? Who knows that Hollywood magic of what they were looking at? All I know is when I left, you could, you could just maybe be invited as a backup to this. So just keep that in mind. You might not make the show um, or you could make it as a backup. And the PA who walked me out to the car is like, I think you're pretty much in, but. It's always, that always feels good until, until yeah. you get the call, but that does kind of feel good. Um, now in season one, Matt had to draw a naked lady and not be pervy. Did you ever have to draw any naked men? don't think I had to do anything like that. I mean, that would have really freaked me out. I bet. I, I bet. was I was trying to balance the idea of reality TV, which I just knew very little about. And back then it wasn't as big as it is now, right? But I was trying to balance it with the fact that I had a potential uh, career I was about to launch uh, in a, it, for the State Department, which reputationally would matter. So I was quite cognizant of anything that would have been overtly sexist. I mean, I don't think if I hadn't figured out the show when I did, I wouldn't have made it through the show. I probably would have left in protest to the, the, <laughs> the stripper and the mashed potatoes or whatever. I mean, so yeah, they, they, they would have lost me if they had me do that. Have you watched the show since? And is it weird for you to watch, like, have you watched the whole show in its entirety? Yeah, the kids and I <laughs> watch it from time to time. I got the DVD when it came out and we watch it in the car when we're going on trips and my daughter just thinks it's hilarious. She's 11 now. Um, I cringe whenever I see it, um, but I watched it. Sure, I watched it every week when it came out. Um, we would, uh, Amanda and Tim and I all lived in DC. So we would have these viewing parties. Um, we would go to, there was a bar in DC and we would go, the three of us and watch it together and, and cringe. And we would also, we got some, we got a chance to see it in advance. They sent us a videotape, if you remember those, oh, yeah. about a week in advance before the show came out so we could be prepared. It was like a rough cut. The Joe Schmo was on a videotape in my house because sometimes we weren't available. So we always had it recording. We had to set the VCR ahead of time. Yeah. And those were the on. days, yeah, right? Was, before before everything was digital and the world <laughs> world wasn't as isn't as fun now. Uh, so you arrive in front of the house, it's day one, you get selected for the show. Tim, your fellow schmo is already there, but at this point, you think you're a contestant on a bachelor style reality show. What's going through your mind? It's good you asked that because I don't know if the producers thought about that. I mean, for me, I'm thinking it's the first day and you're going to make friends and memories. And I'm just thinking about getting to know these people. I just really want to meet these people. And I don't know what the show is going to be about. I don't know how it's going to work. I mean, I just know nothing. And so right away when I got out of the car and I see Tim, I'm so nervous. If you watch that video back, my lip is quavering. I don't know how they were able to hide it in the, in the edit, but it was, I was so, so nervous. And then they had just Tim and I standing there and they were taking pictures. And I just, that kind of pressure behind a camera is overwhelming. So imagine my surprise when all these other people get out and they're so cool. <laughs> they're so collected. And yet Tim and I were scared to death. We were scared to death. These guys are, they act like the cameras aren't even there. They're totally comfortable. Um, I got really nervous. I was really nervous that I was on at the time there was a show called Average Joe. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. And I had heard as I was taking the plane out, I had read something about that show that they didn't know they were the name of the show until they were on it or something like that. So I was convinced I'm going to be on some show that's about like ugly people dating attractive people. I was just worried I was going to get tricked <laughs> in some way. Oh. As long as it wasn't Beauty and the Geek. If, if well, that's what I thought. I was worried I was the geek. 
Oh, so, settle down. Settle I was down. terrified. I mean, that's the level of self-esteem I was working with at whatever that age that was, right? I, I was just convinced that I was going to be a mockery or some kind. And so I felt much more relieved when I saw the people getting out of the car that they were normal <laughs> or attractive or good. So, cause I was really nervous. That whole sequence, um, we see it as it takes place and it takes about 10 minutes, but you're there several, you're probably there a couple of hours at that point, like the black ball ceremony, which we'll get to, which is awful and funny at the same time. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, meeting Austin and Piper and, and that kind of deal. First, we got in the cars, of course, and then we came down and uh, came up. It, it, in retrospect, it wasn't that long. Um, we stood there, they took pictures, and then the other cars started arriving. But I know nothing about how these things work. So people are getting out of the car, and I'm just, I have no idea. So that's why I started chatting with everyone, because I don't know what they're doing, and I don't know why it's taking so long. And then some people had to get out more than once, and this is all new to me. So I don't, I had, I, I just kept trying to talk to everybody and get to know them. And I was ready. I was ready to get the party, ready to get to know people. The one thing that we couldn't have accounted for was Ingrid's ability to question everyone around her. Right. How did they find you? I'm like, oh my God, I've just worked so hard for nothing. It's all over. The show is done. I'm not going to get paid. Fabulous. And we went sort of through all the precautions that you would take with someone who doesn't know the show as well as everyone who's actually on the show. And yet it didn't stick. And it got us on our heels right away. So it was, it was something of a disaster. I kind of, I'm the type of person that felt, that feels like, you know, they can sometimes hopefully save a situation. What did they find you? About that? Um, I was outside my work. I don't know. I wish that model wouldn't have messed up, but um, hopefully we'll be okay. But if not, I'll find that woman and I'll talk to her, make love to her. So you hear the very famous line, uh, I just heard about this yesterday from my agent. Yeah. Now, nothing, to, maybe a little bit to you. The rest of the cast, obviously, they brick for like half a second when they hear this. What did you think when you heard that? What did it immediately get your suspicions up about the whole thing? Walk us through that. I don't think I had the brain power to imagine the whole thing. The idea that there was like a whole show being built around Tim and I was not something that I would have, that I was at, the, I wasn't at that point. But the, when she said that, you can tell when you watch the video that I immediately, my husband's like, uh oh, <laughs> when he watched it, because I went up in my head. The hamster wheel was going and I was thinking, what is going on? Why would that be the case? Do these kinds of shows hire models to come out? And does this mean again that I'm on average Jane? Does this mean again that I'm, because that was my my fear in the back of my head was I am about to be like the, the unattractive person with the, I mean, I was worried about that the whole time. So when this girl says this, in my mind, I made this little story. If she gets eliminated right now, I know that there's a, still a possibility I'm on average Jane. <laughs> and so I've got this equation going in my head and then she gets eliminated. The fact that Cammy didn't get eliminated was the saving grace for me because I thought, you know, Cammy's such a knockout. If she's still here, then I'm not on average Jane because there's nothing average about Cammy. But then something else happened. There was, uh, they had to redo the scene. So I don't know if that's apparent, but in the middle of the black ball ceremony, after they've eliminated all these people and they've got their black balls in their hand, a helicopter came overhead and they said, oh, guys, we're gonna have to reshoot that. And Austin goes back and he actually does it exactly the same. And each of the people he eliminated make the exact same facial expression. And then I was like, oh, those, they're clearly all actors, right? Because if any of them were real people, first, I don't think they'd sit there and get eliminated twice, right? Would you, would you have? No, I would have been like, what? I would have been crying by the time they got through it the second time, like, and I would have had to just stand there. Are you kidding me? And they all just looked like, no problem, reset. And they went. 
So it was, there was no question in my mind because of that retake that they were all actors. I still didn't have that, the idea in my head that I was like, maybe this is just how they're going to make an exciting intro. Maybe there's, so it took me a few (laughs) hours of ruminating to, to realize they were all minorities and to think about, wait a second, (laughs) what is this? What's the implications of this? The funny thing is, is John Holland Moore was working on The Bachelor at the same time as working on wow. uh, on Joe Schmo. So he said, look, it is inevitability that if the people are Caucasian, that they just immediately get out all the people who are minorities right out of there. And people, I remember there being a backlash. It's like, how dare they get rid of all the minorities? It's like, Yes, how dare all the other shows get rid of the minorities? And this show very clearly points out that they do that without any hesitation. I just remember, for me, the clue was not so much that, because it took me a, it took me a few hours to put that together. And I replayed the scene over and over again in my head. Thankfully, they did it twice, so I had a lot of work, lot to work with. <laughs> I noticed that the women that were eliminated were all of an ethnic background, and I didn't like that. Very well. But it was the replaying of it. It was the, I think what the people who did the show were not thinking is how does someone who has never seen a reality team, never been on set, never been to it. I mean, maybe they do this on The Real Bachelor, but I don't know. I've never been to The Real Bachelor. So I don't know what they do. Um, But I just, that stayed with me for, and it just planted the seed right at the beginning that something is, fake here and that was back before we knew that these shows were like filled with fake stuff right I was like this isn't real what's crazy is what you and I would both think is crazy is actually the norm on those shows which is so weird yeah and I didn't know that no no. I mean it was probably the norm but that's still stuff that the normal population didn't know more so now we know because these shows have been exposed to not be real but um but back then I was like redo a scene (laughs) Plus that was like, they were eliminated. I mean, do you know how much work it took to get there? And they're just like, cool with it. I mean, we had to do that. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier. We had to do this like psych examination and um, uh, we had to do this coming out to visit thing. And we had to fill out this questionnaire that was pages and pages long. And I'm like, if you did all that work and then you were eliminated in the first three minutes, I don't know if you'd want to reshoot the scene. Talk about Tim. Um, so he's the, the, at this point, he's the only other real person on the show. Talk about Tim and, you know, your relationship with him throughout the show. From the minute I met T, met Tim, um, it's clear that he, I mean, he's such a great guy. He's such a great guy and has remained a great guy. Um, I felt an immediate, I know this is an overused word on the show, but I felt an immediate connection with Tim. Just a, a, a bond in the um, authenticity. Um, He was very real and he had a lot of real concerns and feelings and stuff. And I could see he was hiding a little bit of his own fears and concerns. And so there was just something very natural about him, but he's a wonderful guy. I was immediately felt like this guy's going to be my friend for the neck for throughout the show. And I wanted to have that connection with everybody else (laughs) that came out of the car too. So I was just, It was just, uh, it was great that they put the two of us up there because immediately I felt an authenticity, which I think helped me through that whole scene. So you mentioned that Austin wasn't your cup of tea. Um, So you're married now and you love Gabriel and everything like that. I'm assuming it's Gabriel, (laughs) not Gabe, but I I know that you love him. Uh, Is there a guy on the show that if things had been real that you could have seen yourself matching up with? There was actually, I think hands down the most interesting person there was Ernie, right? I mean, he was smart. He was, uh, he was, uh, buying orphans for all of us. <laughs> I mean, but he was funny. He was just a really nice guy, but also just a very interesting person. So these are actors who are being, I'm guessing being paid to be on set in retrospect, but the, the kind of conversations we were having when the cameras weren't running, um, Ernie was just talking to us like a regular person, whereas for other people there, they, it was clear, like, I'm not getting paid for this. Time. <laughs> so, uh, but with Ernie, it just, everything felt very real. And to this day, I mean, I've seen, I know his name's not Ernie, but 
<laughs> to this day, I've seen Steve, when I moved here to Los Angeles, I ran into Steve at the San Monica Pier. And I mean, you can't act that genuineness and that kindness and, and just funny. They were all hilarious. They were all hilarious people. Um, but in ter- like, would I date? I would probably, if there was anyone there I'd actually want to go out on a date with, that's, that's the kind of dating I was doing back then is company, right? Who do I want to spend time with? Who would be the most interesting conversation to invite hands down with Ben Ernie? So you're dating with common sense is what you're saying. <laughs> like dating properly the way it's supposed to work. Hey, I mean, I'm, gosh, I probably was the oldest bachelorette <laughs> on any of those shows back then. Right. Cause I, I'm trying to think I was probably uh, almost 30, 20 years ago. Yeah. Almost 30. And uh, to me, dating wasn't the, what it was probably to a lot of people on the bachelorette or I was just a different stage in my life. So yeah, it was different. Clearly I'm revealing what was deep seated insecurity in that, that age, but Austin was too attractive and he was weird. He, <laughs> he was talking to somebody with one personality and another person, he just didn't seem like a real guy. So I just, right from the first minute that we sat alone together, I knew this isn't something that I could actually, I don't believe this person would would look at me and truly, he wasn't really trying to connect. He wasn't really trying to connect. I mean, I should say that now in my career, I, I study people, I do a lot of psychology work, I do it. And so for me, that's part of when you meet someone, you try to take them in. And for me, Austin was, was not a full person. I wasn't seeing a full person. I was seeing like a caricature, but I wanted to hang out. So I was going to play the game. <laughs> so you come up to the second eviction uh, for the ladies and it sees you and Gretchen Palmer, also known as uh, Ambrosia the Bitch. Oh, You're God. the last two to get selected. Oh. Uh, you get selected as the, the, you know, the pearl necklace ceremony, which is in itself. Um, Jay Hall Moore says it's the funniest so thing he's ever written. But uh so all hell breaks loose. So talk us through that whole situation where the reveal happens for you with Ralph taking out his teeth and, and doing the whole call outs and everything, confirming all your suspicions. In reality TV world, we got like three or four episodes. In real life, it was like a day, right? So this was like the, the second day that we were there and I had only the suspicion from this, I mean, I think I had a couple of suspicions, again, being led by my insecurity that I was really about to be made a fool out of, which was my big fear. I was very surprised um, when Cammie asked me if I would join her in the bathroom. I was mostly surprised because Cammie has not made much of an effort up until this point to reach out to any of us girls. You sure you won't tell anybody? Yeah, I promise. What's wrong? Well, the plan was grab Ingrid, pull her aside, and let her know that, you know, I was in this video. So you did it? Well, no, like, at first I didn't want to do it, because, you know, I'm not going to do. You gotta be kidding me. And um, I'm, they actually found out about it. I'm really upset. I don't know what to do. They just came up to me and said, oh, we heard you were in a softcore porn video. Is it true? I did this video, okay? And it's called, it's so stupid. Porked and beans. Are you joking with me? Are you being totally serious right now? She then proceeds to um, tell me and the cameraman, um, but she waited for him to change battery packs so that the story would all be recorded on national television. Cammy was telling the story and the camera operator had to stop and change batteries. Now, if you were a real person and you were telling a story, you would just keep telling the story. Well, Cammy made that mistake. She stopped telling the stories, so she waited. Well, Ingrid picked up on that immediately. It just can't be a real day. I'm starting to doubt if the sun outside is even real or if it's all a mirage. Um, and so I'm picking up on these little things, but it was the moment with Cami in the bathroom that for me just brought a darkness over my head. Like, I think, again, you can see in the video, you can see that I'm gone up into my head. Um, but it was, I, I don't know if it, if how much they captured of it. Cause I haven't seen it in a long time, but she's telling me the story. And of course I did just a little bit of research before I came. So I knew about Sarah Kozer and like what had happened and how they'd re-edited it or something like that. And it was the most hilarious thing. She's telling me about the sex tape 
But in real life, why are you telling me that? Why are you just mentioning that to me? Like there was no motivation for her to tell me this. And then in the middle, the tape went dead, that the, the cameraman's tape stopped. So he took the camera off of, of his shoulder and started to change out the, the tape and she stopped talking. And I was like, why are, you, <laughs> why are you waiting? Not only are you telling me something, you just said you don't want anyone to ever know, but you're giving this guy a chance to reload the camera before you finish the story. And she just, I could just see the fear on her face. And it was at that moment, I was like, something is up. I don't know what it is, but I would say the protections went up right yep. away. The, the editing was, was quite good because as you're talking through the situation in which I'm assuming is your one-on-one -on -one interview, um, it's Ingrid thinks it's all real. Ingrid thinks something is up. That clever, yeah. <laughs> Ingrid, Ingrid is pretty sure that we're all full of shit. And then Ingrid, we're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> is basically yeah. what it said. So I thought was, uh, was, was quite a bit fun of editing. So you go yeah. into this eviction ceremony and now you know that it's full of shit, but you're still in it. So that's right. Are you glad? Like, is there a part of you that just says, I'm so glad that everything, like, what does that feel like when all your suspicions come true? But it wasn't all my, I mean, all I was fair, fearful of, and I think this is what I miss. The producers don't say this in the show, but they're worried I'm figuring it out. I'm just a kid in, at heart thinking I'm about to be made fun of on the playground. So I'm only worried that I am about to be the butt of a joke, that I'm on the average Jane show. Like that's where the remedial level, I had no idea about the whole thing. I mean, that was like, that was bigger than my brain could imagine. But I was piecing together that there was just some actors here. And I don't know how much longer it would have taken to figure out which people were, but I was definitely, I felt like I was in my own game of clue at that point like figuring out who was real. And I was setting up little tests for people at that point. So when the reveal came and we're all standing there and then Austin calls Gretchen a bitch, it just like the shock that went through me. But I talked to a few of the girls and they said you were a fucking bitch. Good luck to you. Omarosa, um, Ambrosia, do you have any parting gifts? Uh, excuse me, parting words. What the fuck? Third runner up. Third runner up. You guys, this, this is a bunch of shit. And, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, so actor. <laughs> so in my checklist, I'm checking off. Okay, so that one's an actor. And then the way she reacted, then I started check, 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 check. So by the time that, um, that Ralph takes out the teeth and the, I, I think my head was just then starting to swirl it together. Um, and obviously the, the extent to which this everyone there was an actor was not something that my brain had fathomed. So there was still some shock there for me walking into that back room. And to your point, Jeremy, the relief, the relief that this isn't a show <laughs> The relief that this isn't a show making fun of the way that I look. I mean, how <laughs> silly in retrospect, right? Like this is actually just making fun of my intelligence, not my looks. That's okay. I think it celebrated your intelligence because they immediately, and this was, this was a thing that, so on the YouTube comments, it's like, oh, they're being so sexist to Ingrid because they're calling her a uh, devil and they're calling her a thing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're doing that because she's way too smart for the show. And uh, Brian Keith, I don't know if you had a chance to watch his interview, but he said that they, you guys were, and it might've been after because we talked for hours. He's awesome. He might've said that you were way too smart for the show right away. That, that they, there was a problem by the end of day one, that they knew that this was going to be very difficult to get over you. So almost a celebration of your of your your ability to just clue everything out. Which is great. I'll take that. I'll take that. I mean, I loved the edit. It was way kinder because to me than I than they could have been, right? Um, and that's the thing, you never know how you're gonna get edited. But for me, the relief, the relief was, oh, this isn't um, <laughs> this isn't the average change show. It's something else. <laughs> And now I felt felt more relaxed. I can enjoy it. I can, and I think there was a lot of stuff happening around 
just like little microaggressions. It's been 20 years, right? Like little things that were happening that were not okay with my feminism at the time. And so once I knew it was all fake, I could laugh at it and join in and have a good time with it. But there were just these little things happening that for me, it was kind of dark up here. I was like, what's going on? Am I being made fun of? Am I being... And so that reveal moment was... (sighs) Is there a part of you that regrets not being able to kind of go through the full of the show or are you happy with the way it turned out? I mean, I watch the show sometimes and I just know what was... Now that I know what was coming, there's just no way. There's no way I would have put on... uh, dug my face into mashed potatoes and <laughs> tried to find a hot dog with a naked woman in a vat of, I mean, th- there was no way I would have wrestled with a stripper um, with uh, balloons filled with whipped cream. Th- I mean, they wouldn't have got, I would have probably quit. <laughs> so they did the right thing. Um, and I, do I regret it? Uh, do I, do I regret figuring it out? I don't regret figuring it out. I think I had this thing in my mind that, you know, the bachelorette bachelor was so glamorous <laughs> and they went to these exciting places and we're going to a strip mall to get our nails done. <laughs> right. And um, so I think in my mind, I had a different expectation of what we were headed into. I thought we were going to travel and do these great things. And here we are going to like the Valley um, and, we didn't leave the, the this house the entire time. I mean, the vineyard was actually a room behind the house. Like it was just a, and it was, so I think I was starting to just get nervous about the quality of the show and what I was doing. And is this gonna be like a really low budget? Uh, I mean, I had all kinds of nervous concerns. Um, so I don't think I could have, I don't think I would have been able to make it through the rest. Um, based entirely upon the the challenges that were coming up. And I think I probably would have had some really embarrassing self-righteous, I can't do this, uh, which would have been really embarrassing. <laughs> so I'm glad I got out what I did. Okay, so now you're a cast member. What yeah. was that change like for you? Um, other than, the again, you're relieved and you're allowed to relax and enjoy it and take on a role. Did the persona that they gave you like, cause I know that they, they said, okay, now you are going to need to, you need to hit some beats here. You need to hit some story beats to be able to get the story going. How much of that was your personality and how much of that was, uh, you know, JMO and BK and all the, the crew behind the scenes, just frantically trying to write in stuff for your character. Oh, I don't know what those guys, re- I don't think I ever really, I got a, I got to come down to the trailer and hear what the day was going to be like but they were not giving me a lot of notes. I was kind of just, they would say, Ingrid, just, you know, be yourself. Or There wasn't a lot of notes about, I mean, I think I was creating my own persona, which was pretty ridiculous. I'm I'm clearly not an actor. And I'm pretty sure I I was uh, irritating uh, as hell to all the other actors who were real artists doing this craft. And here I am just playing around. but I kind of created this like gossipy, um, know-it-all kind of, I mean, I was just playing up parts of my personality, but I, they didn't give me much uh, in terms of here's how we want you to act. There were certain things they wanted me to do. Like they wanted me to tell Amanda about pork and beans. They wanted me to, and all of this, of course, is contingent. They were like, if you can do this, then you get this prize money. <laughs> At the end, when you were in the middle of telling Amanda the pork and beans and the tape ran out, did you stop to wait until the guy could reload his tape? Or did was that one of those things? It's like, hey, if I'm doing this pork and beans thing, you better have enough tape in the goddamn camera because I'm not stopping in the middle to tell this story. That's hilarious. <laughs> Are you insinuating they planned that? Did they plan that? I don't know, but if they did, that's that's another level of meta. Now, right? to be fair, you know. Wernick and Reese created Deadpool. Yes. Well, they didn't create Deadpool, but they wrote Deadpool and they've they've done all the things with and and that does a lot of little meta things. So who knows? Maybe they're, knows? they're mad geniuses. Right. Mad they geniuses. are mad geniuses. Yeah. That's my that's my one regret is once I came over to the actor side, I probably just wasn't the coolest person to hang out with. They were like out there to do a job, and I'm still thinking I'm there to meet friends, and they're like, 
I'm clocking out lady, <laughs> you know, and, but the, but they were such great people. Right. So um, then I was kind of like the fangirl, just uh, hanging out with all these really cool, hilarious people um, and, and not as funny as them and not as uh, don't, didn't have the backgrounds they did, but um, Paul and Rhett were just great guys. And I, so I, I mean, I just, I didn't fit in on the actor side. <laughs> I didn't fit in on either side, but I definitely didn't fit in in the actor's trailer. Um, but they were there and they were also very cool. Who made you laugh the most in the house? Like which, oh, which God. actor did you like? Cause I'm, I'm sure there was downtime when Tim and Amanda were doing things and you were now able to be off camera. So what was that like just interacting? Did you meet them all? I'm, I'm Gerald and now I'm Jonathan. Like, what is that? What was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, the next day I came down and I went to the trailer and they were already like they brought me in and I just was, you know, it's like you're meeting a bunch of comedians and really cool people. And I, I immediately felt that nervousness like I felt on the first day. So I think I kind of withdrew when I was with them. Um, they were hilarious. They were hilarious all the time, even when I was on the uh when I was on the Jane Schmo side, they were equally as funny. There were so many things they didn't show that weren't part of the scene, but were just hilarious. I mean, Bryce, I can't even think, I don't even know any, everybody's real name now. They were all so naturally funny. And there was a constant role of improv and hilarity. It was like, this is the funniest group of people I've ever met. Um, Eleanor was hilarious all the time, all the time. She uh, spent the night in the room with me. She's hilarious. And then she would have to play this weepy character, which was so different than this hilarious, intelligent woman that would be in the room talking to me all night. I think she had the hardest job. She's trying to pretend like she's this character offline when nobody's around. And she's actually this brilliant, hilarious um, strong woman. She's a oh, strong yeah, woman. Yeah, she's a total badass. And I'm taking on some sort of mentor role with her, which in retrospect is so embarrassing, right? <laughs> um, because she at times would come across like this weak and needing support. And I mean, she, I must have just been a thorn in her side or been, she just hated me, I'm sure. I mean, it was funny because later, a couple of years later, I was renting my apartment in New York and I put some pictures online. And I got a response from someone saying, where'd you get that poster? And I said, oh, actually I was on the show. And then I never heard from the person again. And I looked down at the signature and it was her. <laughs> <laughs> she was hilarious. Steve is hilarious. And Bryce, the three of them together, when the cameras weren't rolling and we were just lined up waiting to go somewhere, the three of them were just so funny, just so funny. Um, and they would be constantly cracking jokes. We were laughing all the time. Um, same with, I can't, I don't know people's names. So it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> same, with, same with Garrett and same with, uh, John. I mean, John Flertes was, um, offline. I mean, so much of his character was blurred. Like you could tell even as an, uh, he was turning it up for the camera was my perception. Um, but they were all just so, so polished with their humor and funny. I was like, this has to be the funniest group of people. Jonathan Torrance was famous in Canada. We're not talking like ever, somebody knew him. He, everybody knew who he was. So when he's on this show and nobody recognizes him, nobody knows who he is. It's just, as Canadians, it's, it's funny. It's a, it's a sense of pride for us. Gosh, I feel so bad. They should take away my international relations degree for not <laughs> noticing Jonathan. That's funny. Oh, it's got to be the about. It's got to be the about. It's okay. Yes. That's the so, thing. Is I didn't think he was gay. I just thought he was Canadian. I was like, <laughs> you know, in Canada, they're just really nice and they say words different. And You're walking down the street and somebody says Joe Schmo to you. Okay. So you yeah. haven't been thinking about it. They, they just say Joe Schmo to you and your mind goes off. What is that first thing that pops into your mind about Joe Schmo? Something Tim said. He was like, how often do you get to go to summer camp and get a whole video at the end of all the best <laughs> moments? It was just a fun experience. It was all it was going to be. It's all, and I, and for me, it's just a really fun memory. Are you still in touch with anybody from the show? Uh, you mentioned that you you kind of hung out with Tim and Amanda a little bit after the show, but are you still in touch with anybody from the show? Not regularly. I mean, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with John and I occasionally have run into Steve um, in 
uh, and follow, I follow his career and some of the things he does out here in LA. Uh, but not really, not really. I mean, I hung out with Tim and Amanda in DC a few times. We stayed in connection for a few years. I left DC shortly after the show came out and moved to New York. There was still a Joe Schmo poster on the bus stop that I um, went to for almost like six years. They had that. <laughs> That's how little television programming was occurring. Um, but it just it went. It came in and then it went fast. Mm-hmm. It's the occasional, like you mentioned earlier. It's every once in a while someone will say hey, do I know you? And I'm like, well, maybe you saw me. And they're like, no, I think you actually were getting groceries the other day when I was getting groceries. So came and went. I don't keep up with anyone. I do sometimes exchange like little messages with John. You're standing next to 2003 Ingrid. Are you telling her, are you telling her to go on this show? Of course. Why not? I think it was a it was a it was a uh, experience, which is what I had intended it to be. It was going to be a story I could tell my grandkids. That's all it was ever intended to be. I was not trying to launch a career in Hollywood. I had a fabulous career I was looking forward to in DC. So of course, yeah. I mean, I might I might give her some heads up <laughs> about behavior she may or may not want to show on the show but other than that right I might in- t- advise her around which bikini to wear for the striptease but you know other than that I think I would yeah I do it again I want to say from all of the people that are fans of the show the most common thing that we see on YouTube is people who are who watched it 20 years ago and just go I haven't stopped thinking about this in my everyday life fans appreciate that you took the time to really talk to the, the people that are interested in the show to, to say, look, this was my experience so that they can know what it feels like. So I just want to say thank you very much from my, from me, but from all the people who are going to watch this that are just really big fans of yours. You were a better conscience for this, this show than anyone else had been in the past where people go, no, no way, no way I would do that. And you're sitting there going, no, no, I don't believe it at all. So awesome oh to hear. God. Thank you so much for, for being a part of it. Continue to uh, watch these, uh, watch this channel for these interviews. We're going to continue to talk about Joe Schmo. Thank you, Ingrid, for your time. And we really do appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, Jeremy, for continuing to talk about Joe Schmo and remind people what an event and how exciting and fun it was. And you really have helped bring back lots of fond memories.